Good morning. Like the presser coming tomorrow. This deep fake generated video is a joke. As you all know, I've been busy traveling and following the dead and company and going to concerts. And you might have heard about Janet Yellen's magic mushroom habit. Now you understand why the fiscal and monetary policy is the way it is. You absolute dimwits often forget that I am the CEO of SPY. Higher for longer did not refer to federal funds rates. It was referring to SPY in your retirement account. Because we all know Social Security is fucked in a few years. BT dubs, thanks for passively buying stock every two weeks in you 401k. Tomorrow afternoon, I'm going to come out and be hawkish. But you idiots are going to buy the dip and slam zero DTE calls when my presser begins. Personally, I've been rotating my money into buying more gold calls. You know what's really funny, though? All the Doomer Bears on Twitter and Reddit. They've been calling for a crash when I've delivered them a soft landing. Yet you idiots give them 30 bucks a month for shitty information that is half-baked and misconstrued. If only you had put those 30 bucks a month in NVIDIA since October, you would have easily doubled it. Welcome everybody to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit that notification bell as well as the like button and leave a comment for the algorithm. Let's get into it. This is the daily heat map of the S&P 500. And when you look at this heat map in aggregate, you see a lot of green in the market, broad based gains, and a lot of the red held back by the big names, high growth profile stocks, stuff like Amazon, Eli Lilly, Nvidia, Semiconductor, is software as a whole and then microsoft and apple were flat here today microsoft down infrastructure tech very mixed so that did weigh on the market but all in all a very green day the equal weight very positive today and that's because most sectors did gain i mean technology yes was the only loser down one percent same with materials that is more of a china trade and i think a little bit of profit taking into what has been a very good week for the material sector this week the best performing sector this week by the way and then healthcare this is in red but they were pretty much flat today other than that every other sector was green here today energy the best performing sector up two percent utilities up one percent and it was a mix of defense Defensives, cyclicals, sensitives, and just broad based gains across the board. And it wasn't just large caps, small caps and mid caps gained as well. It was broad based gains across the spectrum. The Russell 2000 was the best performing index today. Large cap growth and large cap fall were the worst performing sectors today. And I mean, this, yes, this did weigh on the market, but all in all, I think it was a fairly positive day with mid cap value and small cap value performing the best. But despite the mixed trading we saw here on Friday, stock market gauges recorded weekly closing highs across the board except in the Russell 2000 the Russell was actually down this week 0.26 percent but we saw gains in the Nasdaq 100 the RSP the equal weight the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones it was a very solid week for all of the major indices from mid caps to large caps and above and this all stemmed from the data we got yesterday and today we got a rock solid GDP print yesterday and a solid GDP print combined with cooling inflation cemented the growing conviction that the Fed can actually nail a soft landing as it embarks on its rate cut campaign. The August reading of personal consumption expenditures, the Fed's preferred gauge of inflation, showed continued cooling in price pressures. The core PCE index, which is the most closely watched by policymakers, rose 0.1% against the forecast of 0.2% month over month. And we actually saw the year over year headline figures come in at 2.2% versus the 2.3%. So disinflation continues its downward trend, but there were some concerning stuff, especially with the personal income outlays. Personal income and personal spending missed expectations. Personal spending came in at 0.2%. Personal income came in at 0.2% as well. The forecast there was 0.3 and 0.4% respectively. And part of the shortfall may have been because incomes for Americans grew less in August than economists expected. You see, as the Fed cuts rates, Americans will get a lower income interest payment on their savings account and other similar holdings, reducing their income almost immediately. But the lower boost in interest rates can give borrowers, while lower interest rates does take its time to work its way into the economy. So consumption spending may likely get squeezed in the short term, but longer term rate cuts are really, really good. And I think that's why the market today sort of just brushed this off and said, hey, you know, we're going to look at the aggregate data over the next couple of months, not just the immediate reading 
15th post the first Fed rate cut. And pretty much all of this data is telling us that the Fed have probably nailed that soft landing. Disinflation continued on trend, growth remaining robust, and rate cuts firmly on the table. And after today's price action, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq 100 finished 0.1 and 0.53% down on the day. The IWM gained, small caps gained, the equal weight gained, mid caps gained, the SP 600 gained. It was a very mixed day for equities, but we saw some downward momentum in yields. The two-year yield, 10-year yield, and 30-year yield all fell on the back of that PCE reading. Pretty much the market telling the Fed, hey, you can continue the 50 basis point rate cut in the next Fed meeting. And when yields fall, bonds gain because they have an inverse relationship. The dollar fell ever so slightly, and then commodities gave some back, except for crude up 0.75%. Gold was down half a percentage point and silver down 1.16% year today. So a very mixed day across asset classes. But looking at the S&P 500, firstly, this is the weekly chart, a very strong uptrend, higher highs, higher lows. That's a weekly closing all-time high, by the way, a closing high. And the advanced decline line making an all-time high. A lot of confluence in this market. The trend is up. This is bullish. And you don't really want to fight the trend in the S&P 500 right now because we're simply making higher highs and higher lows right into new all-time highs super super bullish this is what bull markets look like and if you think we're just gonna like fall out of the sky we're simply not because earnings are strong the economic data is extremely goldilocks right now it's very very good and as long as we keep making higher highs the market will continue to trudge up and look right now the s p 500 guys this level right here this 5400 level until we actually like break this zone right here with conviction i think the market can pull back to this level and we would still be very very bullish and then we can continue to move higher so a lot of room to the downside for the bulls to work and that means the bears have their work cut out for them so until the 5400 level is broken on the weekly chart i actually remain constructively bullish on these markets as a whole especially the s p 500 which is really the gauge for the entire market it, it really is but diving into the daily chart we can see some very very nuanced things right okay we've seen a bit of congested trade here at the top but in the context of making new wick highs new all-time closing highs on a daily basis and you can see that our weekly support zone coincides with this low right here the 5400 area it just seems logical that if we are to break this support zone right here we would then move to the 5400 area and this is our next logical support zone so we have two very key levels to look out for on the weekly chart it's the 5400 area on the daily chart it's the 5660 area and again this is all just on a technical basis until these zones are actually broken i think we probably just continue uh, to digest trade and move higher in the s p 500 if we do go ahead and break the 5600 area like we pull back let's say have some price discovery here then we can actually move to the 5404 area and this is actually very very key confluence because our technical levels are aligning with our gamma levels now they're not one for one but we can see the put support move back down to the 5452 area that is exactly what we said would happen yesterday we saw a bit of volatility compression the gamma flip is at the zone as well sort of the daily line we just looked at previously you can see 56.75 is the gamma flip whereas the daily support zone is at the 56.60 area so a lot of confluence there with the weekly zone and the daily zone with the gamma flip and put support telling us that these are very very strong lines and if we are to go ahead and break this level right here we are then going to be in negative gamma and then we can go ahead and target that 54.52 level but we do want to remain constructively bullish because we do know the trend is from the bottom left to the top right the trend is up call resistance remains at 5800 so we can see a little bit of upside next week but we have a very heavy week of data next week so what do i favor i think we're going to see a pullback next week to the 5675 area i think you know a pullback into this area right here would actually help the markets digest a bit of trade i think we're going to see that and then we're going to make our next move so next week we're going to wait for a pullback to the 5675 area and then 
we're going to see. Are we going to move lower? Are we going to move higher? And a lot's going to be dependent on the labor market report. The NFP is going to determine where we go. But I know the NFP comes out on Friday. So we're going to have to look at the labor market indicators leading up to that. The JOLTS report, the ADP figures, they're going to be our guide as to what the market does. So I think we're going to see a little bit of a pullback to the 5675 area, nothing crazy. And then we're going to make our next move in the S&P 500. The NASDAQ 100, guys, this actually looks very, very strong because we officially closed above this high and we found a little bit of resistance at the core resistance right here. Very, very interesting. What happens now? A couple of things. I want to see the gamma flip move up. We haven't seen that next week, but let's assume it moves up to like this area along with the S&P 500, maybe pulling back to the 5600 area earlier on in the week. That's what I'm expecting. I think we see the NASDAQ 100 pull back, form a higher low relative to this low and some of the price action we saw right here, form a higher low and then continue the move up, break these highs right there. We did see a little bit of a pullback in tech and maybe that pullback can be bought into early next week, maybe Tuesday into Wednesday and then we go from there. But based on this price action we're seeing right now, low, higher low, break this high, the new all-time highs are in focus and that's our initial target. When do we get it? I don't really know. It could be in August but most likely towards the end of August. We normally do see August in election years tend to be a little bit bearish. I do talk about seasonality in the video so go to that section of the video to see what my expectations are for the NASDAQ in the month of October. I keep saying August, I mean October guys. It's very similar to the S&P 500 in the NASDAQ 100. I think we could see a little bit of a pullback and then we'll go ahead and make our move. But this chart looks really, really bullish and it does look like the NASDAQ 100 wants to go take out these all-time highs. And that would obviously be on the back of Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, Amazon, Google Meta, all moving higher and making higher highs relative to the week we just had. Looking at the IWM, the Russell 2000, the RTY, it looks like we're kind of putting in a bottom right here. We didn't quite get to the 2175 gamma flip zone. A lot of selling in today's trade, but this does look like a bottom now. And so what we need to do from here in the IWM is push earlier on in the week. I think we go ahead, break this high, break these highs right here. We do know that the Russell can get on explosive moves. So that's what the Russell needs to do next week. It needs to use this as a formal bottom and go ahead, break this high, break this high right there. But the Russell 2000, we get one bad day to print and this thing falls out of the sky. So as long as we don't break the 2175 area, I'm constructively bullish on the Russell 2000. Looking at the RSP, very constructive. Look at that wick high, that closing high as well. Very, very strong price momentum in the RSP. I think we're going to go break 200 next year. That's exactly what I've been saying, what I've been championing. If you think you missed the boat on the RSP, look at the ticker MOAT. It's actually growing quicker than the RSP. It's actually a little bit cheaper. The RSP trades on 18 times. The Moat Index trades on about 17 times. The expectation for earnings growth is about 16% versus the RSP's 14% for 2025. So it's cheaper growing quicker. Look at the Moat Index. The RSP though, great place to put your money right now. This is relative strength. Look at the year to date chart, guys. This is very, very strong. We see a move to the upside, accumulate accumulation, another move to the upside. Once this move stalls out, we're going to see more accumulation and then the next move will come in the RSP. I'm bullish. I like the RSP. I like what I'm seeing. I think you buy dips at the 176, 175 area, 172 area, all dips to be bought for a move higher into the 200 area in 2025. Looking at gold, guys, I think we're going to see a little bit of a pullback in gold, but as long as we stay above the 2560 area, I think um, we keep making higher highs. I think we see 3000 gold sometime in early 2025 and 3,200 gold by end 2025 as well. I officially made gold a 1% long-term position in my portfolio. I remain bullish on gold, especially with easier monetary policy, red cuts, what's happening in China. Gold is a good a good hedge and a good bet to have. This is CNN's Fear and Greed Index currently sitting at 72, which shows there's a lot of optimism and excitement in the market. Basically, people are feeling confident and willing willing to take on more risk, willing to pay up for that risk, especially with the multiples we're seeing in the market right now. And that is what's pushing price higher. And as a result, sentiment follows price. Price has moved higher and that's why we are in greed territory on the edge of greed and extreme greed. And I think we are going to see a push over the next couple of trading days into the extreme greed area. But when there's this much greed in the air, it's also a sign that maybe the market is getting overheated. Maybe not so much now, but the second we start 
pushing into extreme greed, it may be time to start taking some money off your winners and building a cash position for any volatility that can come because we are in a very volatile time of the year, both in September and October, as well as in an election year. But the reason why things are so bullish right now is that markets just keep making new highs. The S&P 500 has made 40 new highs for 2024. The 2024 estimate is 56.9. I have no idea how they calculate that. To me, that seems silly to go out and predict how many new all-time highs the S&P 500 is going to close for the rest of the year. But we can speak on what has happened and we've made 42 new highs for 2024. And guys, this is very, very bullish. But the bullishness is not not unfounded because at the end of the day, next 12 months earnings per share just keeps moving higher, sitting at an all-time high. And as a result, equity markets will move to all-time highs because stocks reflect the underlying fundamentals. Maybe not in the short term, but in the long term, most definitely. As we also have all-time high earnings, we also see margins continue to move higher, currently sitting at 13%. Here in 2022, at the end of the everything bubble, it was at 13.4%. This chart is a little bit dated. The actual margin profile is sitting at about 13.3% right now. So we're going to see earnings rise next year, huge earnings growth, upward of 14, 15%, and we're going to see margins expand. Equities do very well in that environment. But that is one year out. Looking in the near term, we are going to see a lot of volatility, guys, especially in an election year. This is October seasonality. And what we see in election years, this dotted line right here, is that October tends to be very negative we normally make higher lows lower highs up until the end of october the dashed line is election years the solid line is all years combined and we can see that october tends to be very volatile in election years from the start of the month we pretty much make lower lows lower highs into the end of the month sort of like the 19th 20th we do find a bottom and move up into the november and december period where we do see extreme bullishness especially into the end of the year we call that the santa rally but in election years during October do expect quite a bit of downside at least this is what history is telling us however in non-election years we actually see a fairly bullish October quite the opposite where we actually make higher highs higher lows and normally finish the month in some cases up 1.5 percent but the range is between 1 to 1.5 percent gain in non-election years and we actually see losses spanning from about negative 2.5 percent in stuff like the Russell 2000 to 0.5 percent in the S&P 500. These are declines respectively. So, and guys, do expect a lot of volatility despite the price action we've seen in September. History tells us markets move lower in October and we should expect nothing less. Diving into the macro, looking at the economy, yesterday we got GDP data and I thought I'd just break it down a little bit more because there was some very interesting stuff that I just didn't cover in yesterday's video. The GDP and GDI guys all got revised to the upside. We we saw revisions going as far back as 2022. Real GDP and real GDI got revised up versus their prior figures as you can see from the chart and GDP growth since 2019 has averaged 10.7 percent in GDI gross domestic income 11 percent. A huge uptick from the growth numbers we saw prior. At the same time the 2022 revisions were very very interesting. Revised data now shows GDP rising in the second quarter of 2022. Do you guys remember that technical recession we were in in 2022? It turns out it never happened. We actually saw growth in the second quarter of 2022. Annual revisions now show output grew slightly in the second quarter and that growth coming out of the pandemic was actually faster than previously believed and that's why we saw GDP and GDI revised to the upside. At the same time we also got spending data and the personal savings rate also got revised to the upside from the 3.2% level to the 5.2% level. So people were all saying that uh, the personal savings rate was a bit of a dumpster fire. Well, that figure got revised up and now looking much more healthier than it was just previously. And the truth is the writing was sort of on the wall. When you look at stuff like federal employment tax receipts at 6.5% in September, that's year-over-year -year growth, 6.5% in August, 4.2% in July,
July, 5.6% in June. That is telling us that the consumer is really strong. Employee compensation and disposable income is really, really strong. And that the savings rate now actually reflects these numbers right here. Tax receipts at 5.6%. And this data now is a reflection of that. Generally speaking, you have higher tax receipts. If people are just making more money and it turns out they were actually saving a lot more than previously thought. At the same time, looking at the inflation picture and looking at the inflation picture, PCE came in at 2.2%. This inflation is just on a downward trend. The expectation was actually 2.3% today. We got 2.2% guys. And this is just a Goldilocks scenario we're looking at right now. Great growth, a tight labor market, strong consumer, inflation moving down into rate cuts. That's a Goldilocks scenario. There is weakness in certain parts of it. It just keeps chugging along and, and the continued disinflation we're seeing simply supports the need for rate cuts and further rate cuts through this year into 2025. Looking at data next week, not a lot on the earnings front. We have Carnival on Monday before the open, Paychex and Nike on Tuesday, Levi's on Wednesday, and that's really it for the week. I believe this is either the last or second last week of this second quarter earnings season. Then it's on to the third quarter. And then data next week, guys, we have the major focus is going to be on the manufacturing data, the ISM numbers, as well as non-farms figures, the unemployment rate, as well as the labor force participation, and then average hourly earnings year over year, month over month. So a big week next week with employment data, manufacturing data, and we also have stuff like the ADP, Jolts, a bunch of Fed speakers, Bostic, Cook, Bark, and Collins, and Jerome Powell on Monday as well. So again, it's going to be another data-driven week, and we're going to be taking our lead from the macro but if you've made it up until here thank you so much for watching if you like this video please subscribe hit that notification bell as well as the like button and leave a comment for the algorithm cheers